Hi, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Georgia. Let me tell you, I was excited to do this forecast. I've had kind of a sneak peek into Georgia with the Appalachia Long Range, where I was able to look at this excellent, highly conserved slice of the state. And now I get to get a chance to get into the whole thing. There's a big range of change in this state, which means lots of information that'll help you get an edge on things. Let's look at how temperatures are projected to change. That's the biggest change for this state is this heat up, both with daytime and nighttime temperatures. First, let's look at the historical changes. So we go over to the fourth national climate assessment. We're gonna look at some historical data from 1900 to 2016 about the changes in hot days, days over 95 and warm nights, nights over 75. We can see that in the Southeast as a whole, there haven't been a lot more warm days, although you'll notice already we're starting to see a special area in Georgia here. Keep an eye on this throughout the forecast. But across the Southeast, we have seen nights increasing in warmth. And I wanna notice again in Georgia here, look at all these pale dots in the north of Georgia. That's that conserved area that we looked at in the Appalachia forecast, right? So Georgia already has a little bit of distinctiveness emerging from the Southeast, even as we look at the historical data. And, you know, we do see a nighttime heat up and we gotta look at this change in nighttime temperatures as we look at where the state is going. Let's look at that over to 62 and 63, just a second. So historically, there are very few nights over 75. And those warm nights, they're the ones where if you don't have a chance to recover from heat stress during the day, you can't turn the air conditioning on at night, you get more chronic health problems. Georgia, except down here by the coast, historically has very few warm nights. And if we look at the projections for mid 21st century under reduced emissions, which is what we talk about on this channel, because I think it's the most likely scenario and it presents a pretty good future if we can hit our targets, we can see that Georgia will have relatively few warm nights still up in the northern half of the state. You can see this hot spot on Atlanta, which we're going to be able to do some resilience work to help control. But that down towards this area where we were starting to see a pronounced warming trend, there will be many more warm nights. There will be uh, up to almost two months of warm nights a year. You can see that this change is pretty moderate compared to some other states in the region. Louisiana, for example, sees a much stronger warm night pattern, but this is worth, worth observing. It's very important though, when we look at that data, when we consider Atlanta, there are plenty of other cities in the Southeast that are looking at much warmer nights, which have serious population level impacts on public health. With those warmer nights, with more heat stress on the people, you get more people with heart and lung problems. The federal report has targeted Birmingham, Raleigh, Memphis, and New Orleans, all big cities in this region, to be looking at very challenging increases in nighttime temperatures by 2050. So Atlanta, is not only looking at not too scary a level of heat up, the level of change Atlanta is seeing relative to other cities in the Southeast is excellent. So we're talking about nighttime heat there. Let's look about daytime heat. Let's talk about summer intensity and duration. We're gonna go over to the heat map. And I warn you, this is gonna be a substantial heat up. So brace yourself, but I do think that we have overall a good picture. So here's Atlanta, um, here's Georgia and Atlanta's summer temperatures today. You can see Atlanta's fairly cool there. It's in the zone for the Southeast where maybe you only get three months over 86 a year. And we do see a Klein warming into that Southern part of the state today. Let's go over to 2050, RCP 4.5, that moderate emission scenario. And we do see changes. They're changes in degree rather than changes in kind, right? Let's look over here. We can see that Atlanta is right on the edge of staying in that cooler zone. So doing things like increasing the tree canopy to decrease the heat island effect are going to be just crucial. It could help knock a month of days over 86 off of your forecast. Pretty cool. This area here, warming up quite dramatically, warming up quite dramatically in southern Georgia. 
we're going towards uh, 180 degrees, uh, 180 days over 86 degrees, excuse me there. Let's uh, look back. There's historical. There's projected. I want to zoom out a little bit because what is this part of Georgia turning into is the question that I want to ask, right? So we're looking at contemporary data for central Florida for like Orlando. So it's like a historical Orlando summer is coming into Georgia and Florida is changing into something else. It's changing into a hotter, more tropical environment. Let's keep that in mind as we look at this next piece of the puzzle. So we've got this Orlando-like summer coming into Southern Georgia. Let's look at the changes in plant hardiness zone because from the nighttime temperatures, the daytime temperatures, the summer temperatures, I'm starting to see uh, citrus growing territory coming into Georgia. Let's look at that plant hardiness zone because we know citrus is going to be very sensitive to changes in the, the winter temperatures, right? We got to figure this out. All right, here we go. This is the USDA's plant hardiness zone map, looking at plant hardiness zones from the 80s to 2009. Right now in Georgia, we have three distinct plant hardiness zones ranging from seven in the north, eight in the middle, nine at the bottom. Let's look over at what happens with the 2050. And yep, we get a big movement up of that zone nine, that potential citrus growing territory into Georgia. We see some retreat of zone seven, a fair amount of stability though in this belt here, which let me get myself oriented, make sure I'm hitting it. Yep. This belt right here is your peach belt, right? Right around Macon. I'm sorry if I say that wrong. No change there. Big change as we come up towards Statesboro and Vidalia. That's where we start to get into that zone nine, that citrus growing territory. And this to me is, is pretty interesting. I want to show you one more piece of information about this tropical transition as we're putting the picture together. Let's look at the precipitation trends in the federal report. Give me one second to pull that up. All right, I've got it. If only I can get my mouse to work. Yes. Okay. All right, so we're not great at predicting precipitation two years out, let alone 30 years out, right? But we're able to look at historical trends and it seems like the, at this point, trends are likely to continue. If we look at historical changes in heavy precipitation from um, 1900 to 2016, we see that precipitation trends are also changing in Georgia. Maybe I'm dumb, it really bothers me that less water is represented by blue and more water is represented by red. This trips me up all the time, but I'm gonna get it right this time. We can see that in Georgia, there's a decrease of precipitation to the north and an increase of precipitation to the south here. In this potential citrus growing region, especially, we're getting a lot more water, which is good, fairly thirsty tree crop. And we see, that this area that's been historically an important citrus growing zone has seen a lot of increased drying. So we have a real movement of every factor around Florida orange growth. We've got a movement of nighttime temperature, daytime temperature, precipitation, summer duration, winter lows. This is very unusual and, and pretty cool. Oftentimes when I see the climate shifting, it'll be shifting in different ways. A region will get um, the heat from the south, but they won't get the precipitation patterns, for example. Or it'll be getting wetter, but the winter will be changing in a different direction. The winter will be getting either milder or, um, than the previous wet climate. I'm not saying this so good, but here's the point. Here's the point. I want to show you this map of where citrus is grown right now in the United States. If you've watched the California forecast, you know that we're gonna lose the California oranges, at least in this uh, volume, right? 
because of a water stress, because of lack of water in the area. The same thing is probably true of this small proportion of oranges grown in Southern Texas. And in Florida, this zone that has allowed so much domestic citrus production is changing. That is popping right up here. We saw everything that makes this area special is coming right up here to Georgia. And why do they grow so many oranges there? Because oranges are an extremely valuable cash crop, right? So to me, this is a very interesting story that is forming up for Georgia. It's coming together pretty quick, clearly, right? It's a big change, but it's a change to conditions that we understand, to landscapes we can go and see right now. It's not hard to envision what this part of Georgia could look like in 2050, and it's not particularly unpleasant. The conditions that are forming up in Southern Georgia are becoming very similar to where the vast majority of the nation's oranges are grown right now. There are great opportunities in that mild tropic environment, but there are challenges with the landscape transition, of course. So across the Southeast, there's landscape transformation occurring. And that's hard and it's scary and it's brought substantially more wildfires into the region. It's a threat that's really changed in magnitude. Wildfires are worse in some states than in Georgia, but I wanna show you there's data out of Georgia about getting these fires under control. It's always nice when you can see local data, right? So let's get over there. So the example that the feds use for wildfire is this example in um, Fort Benning, where they were having a lot of wildfires in the 80s and started managing them with prescribed burns. And we can see that the more prescribed burns that we had of Fort Benning, the wildfires decreased dramatically. So we can see in Georgia the work that we can put in towards managing the landscape and that that will have dramatic impact on our health and safety, dramatic positive impact. We know in Georgia also that a lot of change is going to come on near the coast. And let's talk about that a little bit more. The sea level rise in the Atlantic is not predicted to be as big as in the Gulf. Charleston has put in a lot of work, understandably. They're getting ready for 1.5 to 2.5 feet of sea level rise. That's in line with the highest projections for 50 years out, plus a little bit more, because they're working to stay safe. They're using that high estimate, that 2.5 estimate for critical resources, for building resiliency around hospitals, for example. There is some data from Georgia on current coastal flooding trends. So let's get a little local data there. Just one second while I pull that up. All right, so this is from near Savannah. So for Savannah, we have observations of how many high tide flooding days we had a year going back to the 60s. And we do see in this black line, the observations, which show that we do have an upward trend, right? And if that trend followed by 2050, we would have more high tide flooding days a year. We would have be starting to approach maybe uh, 40, 40 or 50 of them a year. But because of the information that we have about melting glaciers, we think it's wise to prepare for more. We think that it's probably going to be important in Savannah, Georgia to start to prepare for around 70, 70 to 100 high tide flooding days a year by 2050. It's a real problem. It's complicated by international factors, but we are aware of an observed trend within the human lifetime. In having that perspective, looking at local data, knowing that 2.5 is like the maximum that any municipality in the area is prepared for from looking at all of the data, let's go over to the NOAA sea level rise viewer. All right, so we'll get started. We'll go and look at the Georgia coast. And there is gonna be some sad stuff that we have to look at here. The most vulnerable part of the Georgia coast is going to be here by the sea islands, by the border with the Carolinas. If we go from here, this slider shows the mean higher high water mark, the current one. We look up at one foot, 
two feet, we do see a lot of loss of coastline in these pretty islands, in the sea islands. Over here, we see that there's going to be potential for a lot of saltwater incursion. These marshy areas show where you're going to have potential incursion, potential flooding. We'll go back down to currents as we move into another county. We we'll look at two feet. We can see it's not a tremendous direct inundation, but there are people who are going to be impacted by sea level rise. There are agricultural areas where I would anticipate changes to the soil quality as we see the salt water move in there. All right, we're back to current conditions. As we look at the southern edge of the coast. And here you'll notice as we get farther south, we see very much the same story. We see that where you have some movement between the sea and the land, it becomes more extreme. We'll move back down. Your marshy areas become open water. You see threats to infrastructure. This road right here, right? This is going to have some serious problem. It's going to be lifted or moved. And we have open water extending fairly far in to areas that uh, previously only saw maybe some storm surge, some marsh activity. And that's gonna be impacting small communities, agricultural communities, vulnerable communities. So there are people in Georgia, particularly in the Sea Islands that are gonna need help. These communities are gonna need help. They're gonna be experiencing real grief, real loss with no big upside. But to the degree that it is possible, and as it should not surprise you, Georgia and these coastal areas, they're working very hard to help themselves. Tybee Island and Chatham County particularly have earned national recognition as places in Georgia that are performing way above the rest of the nation in terms of awareness of sea level rise, creating roadmaps for change, and executing their plans. Sea level rise here, it's serious. There's going to be serious community impact but there is a lot of work already underway to meet the challenges. There are people in Georgia are working to protect communities, to protect historic sites, protect the state's heritage and beauty. There's really nice work already happening in the state to improve Georgia's coastal resilience. I think there's a lot of room for pride here, even as we recognize that it is a serious threat. So Georgia, let's pull this all together. Let's talk about some opportunities. There are big changes coming for your state. But it is awesome to look at the ways your state is already preparing for change. I know a lot of people are very concerned in Georgia. I get emails. I've heard from many people in the state who are scared they're going to need to leave, that the climate change will be too intense for the area. And it is intense, right? There's a lot of change going on. But I look at the data. I think the resilience potential is very exciting. The potential for Atlanta is just fabulous. It's one of the largest cities in the southeast that won't have a huge nighttime warm up. It's very nice in terms of manageable changes in power demand. Atlantans need to work on improving your tree cover. You gotta do that pretty hard. Reduce the urban heat island effect, but you can do that. You can plant some trees. These are challenges you can do. That whole new belt, that new agricultural territory in the Southern half of the state, that's very interesting in terms of commercial opportunities. As we move into citrus territory in Georgia, particularly your cold hardy citrus like pomelos, clementine, Meyer lemon, there's a lot of, a lot of potential. That peach belt is kind of in the middle of the state and we saw that a lot of it isn't changing in zone. A lot of that, it might shift a little bit up to the north, but in the zone nine area with the plenty of water forecast, that's gonna be very precious. A uh, zone nine area, that maintains adequate water is gonna be washed out of the Central Valley. It's gonna be changing in Florida, but Florida citrus groves, they're gonna be so warm, you could be looking at growing mango down there. When we look at the international picture, we're very fortunate, those of us who live here in North America, 
And these domestic tropical fruits are gonna see a big opportunity. Georgia, it's good you're all very strong and welcoming, particularly inland, particularly in that Northern inland region. I strongly suspect that you will see population growth rather than loss in the years to come. Y'all get ready, I'm hopeful for you. And if you are interested in getting involved with resilience work locally, I wanna show you this fabulous state level uh, website and initiative. We got the Georgia Climate Project. They do great storytelling work. They help get people involved. They help get uh, everything together for the state. You can be part of this Georgia story. And I, I'm gonna be very excited by 2050 to see what you all can do. This is Dr. Scherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.